بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله تبارك وتعالى وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثات وكل محدثة بدعة ودعاء ضلالة كل ضلالة في النار Brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. I know that we are waiting for a long time now and uh, I don't need to introduce our lecture to you. Anyhow, uh, we always uh, take the chance if our elder brothers, the scholars or the erudites to come here and we try our best to invite them to come to the mosque to enlighten us in the subjects they are specializing. Uh, you know our uh, brother Ahmad Didad. Uh, I, I can't imagine how he digested the Holy Bible, the Holy Quran, the other literature written about the Christianity and about Judaism and about these subjects related to the religion. Uh, as a matter of fact, when I see him, every time I see him, I look at myself as a child, little child, comparing with his language in the religious matters. Uh, I hope that all of us, inshallah, we will be benefited by what he will lecture us and will listen attentively to him and be benefited by his knowledge. I call upon our brother, Mr. Ahmadina. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أهل الكتاب لا تغلوا في دينكم ولا تقولوا على الله إلا الحق إنما المسيح عيسى بن مريم رسول الله وكلمته ألقاها إلى مريم وروح منه فآمنوا بالله ورسوله صدق الله صدق الله المرة العظيم Mr. Chairman and my dear brothers and sisters, the subject, as has been advertised, is Jesus, man, myth, or God. But before we delve into the subject, the atmosphere at the moment in the UK is the atmosphere of the debate that took place on Sunday. People want to know those who have not been there, because we can't expect the whole of Britain to be there, there were about 12,000 people on Sunday. From all over Britain and from the Arab countries and from Africa, they had come. The largest covered hall in Europe was packed to capacity. People want to know what transpired, those of you that were not there. Those of you who were there, can you just put up your hand, I'll have an idea. Oh, mashallah, mashallah. Almost one third of my brothers and sisters were there. But I might share with you certain things that I was not able to share in that meeting, those of you who were there. This might be altogether new to those who were not there. That how the whole thing came about and the response of the Muslims, that the Muslims on this occasion they seem to have been the liveliest of audiences that I have ever addressed. What made them so, so lively? Because usually the Muslims are very placid, quiet, calm. You know, even if it needs, calls for an applause, you will find that they are like straight jacketed. They won't utter a sound and they won't show any signs that they, are, they appreciate a point, generally. But on Sunday it was not so. Now I have been trying to analyze why all this extra spirit in the Muslim. I may be wrong. You might have better answers than what I'm going to give you this moment. You see, this gentleman happens to be an Arab. There's no doubt about that. He was born an Arab Christian. And he has been boasting that his people have been Christians before Islam. So it's not a conversion from Islam to Christianity. They were Christians and the Muslims came and overtook their lands. 
Most of these Arab countries were Christian lands. Egypt was Christian. Libya was Christian. Morocco was Christian. Syria was Christian. Lebanon was Christian. The whole of Palestine was Christian. When the Muslims came out of the desert fastness and they conquered these territories and the people accepted Islam. So these are the remnants that have been left behind. They are boasting today that there are 14 million Arab Christians, which the Muslim doesn't seem to know, realize. 14 million. In July 1975, he claimed 10 million. On Sunday, he said there are now 14 million. We won't argue with him. We must be on guard. There are 14 million Arab Christians in the Arab world. But this time, he came in the garb of an Arab. Previously, you might have seen, uh, you saw him in the Royal Albert Hall. That's him. That's him. Then, when we had advertised previously his picture as an Arab, he took exception to that. He didn't want to be photographed like this. But this picture we got from his book, The Liberated Palestinian. We got it from here. Among some three million refugees, Palestinian refugees, he is a unique person. This born again Christian, evangelist in America, now an American citizen, he says he's liberated. His people are in hell, but he is in heaven. He's liberated. And the irony of his book is that on the cover, he puts the Israeli star of David. Still, you know, a sting at the heart of any Muslim or Palestinian, the star of David and the uh, Israeli warplanes and the Israeli tanks. And he is liberated. But now, this book, the Muslims hadn't seen this, because this is circulated mostly in America, trying to get sympathy of the American Jews and Christians to finance him in his work. But now, we, when we printed this poster, the man didn't like it. He sent us this photo, taken in a studio, beautiful picture, which was advertised in the Sunday Times magazine section, Sunday Times. You can see nice, clean, shaven, you know, real a westernized Arab. No doubt about that. Now, this is what people expected to see. A westernized man from America coming along and giving battle to the Muslim. But this man came like a wolf in sheep's clothing. He attired himself not only just a, garab, uh, a loose garb, but he put on that, I don't know what you call that, with that uh, black band around. Regard, regard, yes. And a nice jubba and a beard. He grew a special beard for the occasion. <laughs> he says that, you know, he says it took him three months, you know, to grow that beautiful beard. In other words, a picture of deception. Now, naturally, the Muslim, when he sees that, you know, it hurts him. He says, now look, what are you up to now? Why are you camouflaging yourself? Then, he thought he had one on us. You see, in the debate that took place in the Royal Albert Hall, the arrangement was that who speaks first depends on the tossing of the coin. And he won the toss. So when he won the toss, no, I'm sorry, I beg your pardon, I won the toss. So I said, let him speak first. I had a reason. My reason was that, look, I don't know what he has got. So whatever he produces, I will be able to refute them. I'll have an hour to refute what he has already said. So I said, let him speak. But for this debate, I had made up my mind that whatever happens, I must speak first. That was the decision we had come to. But now how? If I win the toss, I choose myself to speak first. And if he loses, at the back of my mind, I said, this guy is a rebellious brawler. You know, he's the one who wants to put up a fight. But there's no fight, he wants to put up a fight. Innocent things, time factor, this, that, who, every little thing, the amount of trouble he gave me in the Royal Albert Hall. Up to the last minute, we couldn't decide on a format. Up to the last minute. Whatever you say, he thinks there's something wrong with that. He's suspicious, you see. So, there must be something wrong. There must be a catch. So says, I know now. Says, if he wins, I'm sure he wants to take revenge. He says, last time you made me to speak, now I make you to speak. 
Alhamdulillah, actually he played into our hands. You see, what is strategy? Our Nabi Karim Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Al-Hirbu Khit'un, war is strategy. And you have to use strategy when you go into battle with the intellectual or with the gun. Strategy you need. So the strategy I had in mind was that I got, we got so much material that we can throw at him and he will not be able to touch anything. And amazing, it's a miracle. That for one hour and 15 minutes, I have been throwing things at him. You, when you get the tape, you see the tape and you verify it for yourself. Throwing things at him, so come on, answer this, answer this, answer this. The Bible is not the word of God. The Quran is. The Bible is not the word of God. The Quran is. And when his turn came, as if he never heard anything. As if he didn't hear. He was like a punch drunk boxer. You know, he just gets into battle, not knowing, you know, he only knows that the bell has rung. You see, so he gets into, into, into battle. He doesn't know what has really hit him. So, uh, one of the things that hit him the hardest and made the Arabs to react strongest, the Arabs in the audience, was that this man, he believes in a book. And I gave quotations from the book, the Bible, the Holy Bible. In which I'm telling him, I said, one Jewish boy, one Jewish lad, he killed 600 Palestinians with a stick. I demonstrated the stick, I brought a stick with a little nail in front of it. With that little stick, he killed 600 Palestinians. So I'm asking him, you believe that? And he said, yes. One boy, Jewish boy with a little stick, he killed 600 Palestinians. Then another Jew, with the jawbone of a donkey, you know this jawbone, but the donkey's jawbone. With that he killed 1,000 Palestinians. I said, look, won't you want to run away, man? Huh? Look, if he's killing the man, kill one, two, three, four, fifty, hundred, damn it all, you thousand, what are you waiting for, man? And I said, you thousand Palestinians, if you only spat on that guy, he would have suffocated with the spit. Couldn't you do that even? And we are like, you believe that? And the guy says, yes, he believes that. Then I says, you know, you Palestinians are so worthless, actually, so worthless. In this book, this book of God, that David, you know, it's Hazrat Dawud He wanted to marry Saul's daughter, Talut. Talut was the king. He wanted to marry his daughter called Mishal. So Saul said, look, the dowry for my daughter is 104 skins of the Palestinians. You know what's foreskins? When we circumcise our children, you know the little skin that you throw away? That's called a foreskin. He wanted 100. David, you know, is too generous. So he goes and kills 200 Palestinians and he takes off their foreskins, 200 dead Palestinians, he takes the foreskins and he comes and he counts them out in full. The Bible says he counted out in full. 200, 1, 2, 3, 4, like you counted out 1 pound, 2 pound. How many pounds do you want for your daughter? I said 200 pounds. So he counted out in full 200 foreskins of the Palestinians. You believe that? The guy believes it. <laughs> you know, I said, what's wrong with you people, man? Then, God is very merciful to the Palestinians for some special reason. He has been telling the Jews, kill the Palestinians, men, women and children, spare nothing that lives, nothing that breathes, even donkeys must be killed. This God Almighty, the author of the Bible as he believes, now he says, look, kill them all, men, women and children, even the little ones, boys and girls, male and female, kill them all. But only young women, grown up women, who would be of marriageable age, those women you say for yourself. But you must verify that they are virgins, that no man has known. If you, in testing them out, if you find that they have been second hand, kill them. But if you can prove that they are virgins, that you say for yourself. Now, soldiers in the field, think man, think. Soldiers in the field, Jewish soldiers, Hmm? Killing men, women and children. Now they come across a young girl of 12. They want to verify. So how do you verify? There was no saliva test those days, you know. Today the doctors, they take the saliva of the woman to find out if the woman is pregnant or not. Saliva test. There was no such thing. The only manner in which you can verify is to rape and ravish these women. And so they went through and they discovered that 
32,000 of these Palestinian girls were virgins. How did they test it? You can imagine, left to your imagination. 32,000. And out of the 32,000, the Lord God wants his share. God also wants a share out of those raped and ravished Palestinian girls. And it says, and 30 and 2, 32 was the Lord's share, share of Allah's share. I am asking, what does God do with raped and ravished Palestinian girls? You tell me. You believe that? Of course he believes it. Now when you believe in things like that, it creates a type of mentality. Cow down that this is your destiny man, you. You are supposed to be the hewers of wood and the drawers of water. These are your gods, you can do nothing to them. One boy can kill 600, another Jew he can kill a thousand. And you people are so cheap in the sight of God, kill them, kill them, kill them. God's word? He said yes, it's God's word. So what he does is, he writes a book. Once you have that mentality, with that mentality you write a book. And he's given away the whole of Palestine to the Jews in this book. He's advising the people. In other words, he said, look man, what are you fighting for? All this Palestine was promised to the Jews. This is these Arabs. He points out, this is a strange that they are not happy that the Jews should have 10,000 square miles. Actually, God had promised them from the Nile to the Euphrates. And in 1982, when they attacked southern Lebanon, he said, look, this is also part of the prophecy. What are you crying about? So, now he's very generous to the Palestinian people. He said, he, what he opts for is a small state on the West Bank for the Palestinians, small state, with a police force, but no standing army. In other words, a vassal of Israel. Small state, what happened to Gaza? Mm -hmm. He's not worried about Gaza. That's all involved from the Nile to the Euphrates. Give it away. Now, naturally, when the Arab Muslim hears this, and I don't know if there are any Palestinians there, the George Habash, you know, he's supposed to be a Palestinian Christian. I don't know if his group hears about this guy that this is a traitor, a quizzling. Naturally you get worked up. So then he started speaking lies. He started insulting the audience, which is never done. Wallah, you never do that. <laughs> you are wanting to commit suicide. <laughs> Look, you are in confrontation with the whole audience. You can't, I mean, you can't satisfy everybody, but you are on a confrontation course and you're calling people names that you got no brains, you know, you got no intelligence, you got no sense. Shh, unforgivable. For, but that means that is the arrogance, some type of arrogance that's in him, makes him to bleed out. Then I pointed out to the audience that this man had lied. He had lied again and again about the Quran. If you remember, if you have seen that videotape, this videotape about the debate in the Royal Albert Hall, is Jesus God? You see this videotape? On that you find at the beginning he appears. He appeared at the first debate that took place in the Royal Albert Hall. At question time, he comes forward. We don't know who he is. Very well spoken, speaks good English. And in that immaculate English of his, he says, Mr. Didat, you Muslims believe that Jesus hasn't died. He said, yes. But he said, what have you to say to this? And he quotes the Quran. Okay. I was stunned. I'm thinking he's a Pakistani. Usually the Qadianis quote that verse, usually. And this guy is quoting the Quran and he says, Wasalamun alayya. You know, in his usual Arabic style. Wasalamun alayya. Yawma ulitu. Wa yawma amutu. Wa yawma ubasuhayya. Which means, he says, he translates. Before Jesus was born, he died and he rose again. Uh, he says, uh, so, so the peace is on me. The day that I was born, the day that I died, and the day that I shall be raised back to life again. What have I to say to that? The Quran says that he died, and I say he didn't die. The Muslims say he didn't die. Fortunately, fortunately for me, he was playing into my hands. This is Allah's way. I'm not an Arabicist, you know, that means I know Arabic. I don't know the Quran as a whole, I don't know the Arabic language, but he is actually playing into my hands. He's throwing a ball straight at me, he's getting caught out. I know this verse. So I said, you see, the verse you quoted, 
wasalam alayya yawma wulidtu wa yawma amutu wa yawma uwa sahiya means so peace is on me the day that I was born the day that I die in the future tense not the day that I died and the day that I shall be raised to life again so alhamdulillah the people appreciated and they applauded that means the man was lying he lied about the Quran he is an Arab and he is lying in his translation then during the course of the debate if you remember he said you know I'd like to urge you to consider that when we say Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, we see the Trinity 113 times in the Quran, like the Bible says, Bismil Ab Wal Ibn Waruh al Qudus. Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost appear in the Quran 113 times. And say Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Which he gave the translation as Allah Rahman and Rahim, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. <laughs> The, the stupidity to the extent to his arrogance in trying to bamboozle maybe he was placating trying to curry favor with these Christians in the audience he says you see I'm an Arab and I can get away with it so all these are fools and I can do what I like with them so I said look this is not Trinity Allah is telling us that he is Allah who is Rahman and who is Rahim Allah is Rahman and Rahim there is not Allah and Rahman and Rahim. Your Trinity is in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. You know, and the conjunction, and, and, and means three different persons. This is the same Allah who is Rahman and Rahim, and we are given so many attributes of Allah, 99 in the Quran, Huwallahu Allazi la ilaha illahu, that He is Allah besides whom there is no other God, Al Malik, the King, Al Quddus, the Holy One, As Salam, the source of peace and perfection, and who. And Al Aziz, Al Jabbar, and these are not so many gods, it's the same God with these different attributes. So again, he tried to pull a fast one upon the Muslims, he bluffed us. Then he made another lie. He said, You know, even the Quran testifies that Jesus is the only person who knows the hour of judgment. Jesus is the only one in the Quran in which the Quran says that he knew of the day of judgment, the last day. Again he lied. The Quran says that it will be the sign of the coming of the hour of judgment. That he, not that he knows. He lied about the Quran. Then a bigger and greater lie. At one stage in his talk at the debate here in the Royal Albert Hall. He said, Let me challenge you. 75% of the wonderful Quran in my wonderful language of Arabic is from the Bible. And I would urge you to look into the Bible and find out where these sources are. Let me challenge you. Now this is bombastic. The bravado with which he speaks. Let me challenge you, either challenging me or the whole audience. Let me challenge you. 75% of that wonderful Quran in my wonderful language of Arabic is from the Bible. You know what is 75%? Three quarter, three quarter of this book is from the Bible. Lies, lies, lies. So I exposed him. I said, look, you said three quarter. We don't want 75%. Give me one. Just give me one. One example, one comparison where you said, look, this is now copied from my Bible. In my Bible it says, for example, Ya mu'allimu nuridu an nara minka ayatan So you open the Quran, you see the same thing Ya mu'allimu nuridu an nara minka ayatan You read the Bible Fa ajaba wa kala lahum You read open the Quran Fa ajaba wa kala lahum Jilun shirirun wa fasikun Open the Quran Jilun shirir That is copying This is copying This is cribbing This is plagiarism One verse just produce one verse and I put the Quran the Arabic Bible I put one side and I put the Arabic Quran so while I'm telling I said look you remember you challenged me can you do that he said yes now he was like, get up there and then I said no wait a minute you'll have your turn you'll have your turn he had his turn he left the Quran and the Bible he didn't touch it but he did do something and the audience didn't catch the joke. Even it was difficult for me to catch what was going on. 
You see, there was something wrong in his delivery. He was speaking at 100 miles an hour. And then he was reading, he was not speaking, he was actually reading. And he had some, the preparation he had made, he wanted to read the whole thing through. Whether you understand or you don't understand, that means he did the job. He wanted to complete his job, read it all through. So while he was reading, something did sound like the Quran. I don't know those of you who were there, you'll remember. He had this book. This book with him, this green book. This is a new production of the Arab Christians. What's the title, Yasha? It's hard for me to read. Seerat al Masih. Seerat al Masih. Fasih Arabi. This is Seerat al Masih. You know, this Seerat in the life of Jesus, you know, in the Fasih, in the eloquent Arabic. So he read from here a chapter here. Uh, just a few lines if you read. This is what he read. Bismillah ar Rahman Rahim. This one here. That's right. Bismillah ar Rahman ar Rahim. Qul ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu in kuntum tu'minuna billahi haqqan fa'aminu bi wa la taqafu inna lakum inda Allah jannatin nuzula. Right. Right. So you see now what's happening? This is in the Fasih Balikh Arabic. This, they have now produced this as a challenge to the Quran. The Arab Christians have done this as a challenge to the Quran. Listen now, to the non-Arab, you can't judge, wallah. Because now the words are from the Quran. The words are from the Quran. They're using for their own now, but it's not the language of the Bible. It's insipid. There's, no, there's nothing in it, you know, insipid. Even to the Arab, he realizes that there's nothing in it. Even the Arab Christian recognizes that there's nothing like the Quran. But so now, to compete with the Quran, you copy the Quran. So when you copy the Quran, you begin. Every chapter now begins. Of the Christian Bible, every chapter begins. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. And this is competing with the Quran to say, look, we produce something. I said, this is, you are stealing from my book. You are cribbing, you are stealing, and now you're saying, now look, this is like the Quran. Every chapter now begins with Bismillah. And the fellow does. You see, when we take the Quran, you open every chapter, it says Makkiyah Surah, Makkiyah or Madaniya. That this Surah was revealed in Makkah or in Medina. In Makkah or in Medina. So they do the same. They do the same. So they say these Surahs now, they say this is Makdisi. Makdisi. Makdisi means Baitul Muqaddas in Jerusalem. Nowhere in the Christian Bible, anywhere, have they got this sort of thing now. Then the words I have marked in green. Everything is from the Quran. What they do, they, borrow, they call this new science. This is the new science. They call it contextualization. Contextualization. It was a new word for me. You see, they had given with this book secret instructions. That this must not fall into Muslim hands, the instruction book. But Allah is musabibul asbab. You know, if you are in the field, the things that come to you are unimaginable. So where did you get it, Mr. Didad? I said, don't ask questions. Don't ask questions. Look, Allah barit Allah, he sends it. Because you are in the field, this is his job. That if you are working for him, things keep coming your way. That means now, you are prepared. Allah is preparing you beforehand. He's preparing you beforehand. He said, look. Because otherwise it takes you off guard. This is many sounds like the Quran. Could it be that they invented it? No. They are copying, copying about from Surah Maryam. You read there. Zikr Rahmati Rabbika Abdahu Zakariya. So they start here. The same style, same style. They copy the Quran. It says Zikr Ta'budi Zakariya. Now the person doesn't say maybe you know something, but it sounds similar. Then al muttaqin wa ma kana shaykhun kabir lidhul al mihrabi. All these are phrases from the Quran, which they are putting that in the new New Testament to catch the Arab fish. That this Arab fellow, ignorant Arab, you know, he will fall for this. So naturally, the Arab who understands is mispronouncing so many things. He reacts, he reacts. He was lucky, you know, that there was an exit from the back. Otherwise, I feared for him. 
Some of the things I didn't mention, you know, something that you can remember, that the book that he gave me in the previous debate, you were there, yeah, Sheikh. You know, he gave me that green parcel. He said, you know, we Arabs, when we, we, are, we are taught that when we go to, uh, to meet a friend, we don't go empty-handed. So he scored a point. Look, the Muslim went empty-handed. He came along with this parcel, he gave it to me. But he didn't know what he was doing. This is Allah's way. This Bible is one of the most valuable Bibles you can get. This is what is called a red letter Bible. Red letter Bible. Everything that Jesus spoke is in red. Easy for you to find. You know how much easy it makes for us now? To talk to them? With this Bible. Red letter. Whatever Jesus said is in red. So let's say we accept that that is Injil. Let us say that every word that Jesus spoke that is in red is a we accept. For the sake of argument, we accept. So, so let's have a look. What did Jesus say? You say the New Testament is the Injil. He said yes. So well, let's have a look. The New Testament has 27 books. 27 books. Out of the 27, in this particular one, 21 out of 27 has not got a red dot or a dash or a doodle. Not even a scribble. Not even a smudge. Not even a red smudge. 21 out of 27. How many percent is that? You work it out. Then in the New Living Bible, also red letter, 23 out of 27. There's not even a red dot or a dash or a doodle. And you say, this is the Injil. You say this is the Injil. You didn't even quote Jesus. Leave out Jesus, God talking to him. But you didn't even quote Jesus in 23 out of the 24 books. He is not even quoted, not even once. And you say this is the Injil. However, in this so-called Injil, in this particular one, and there are many other Bibles, you find that Jesus is made to do funny, funny things, silly, silly things. I'm only reading from the Gospel of St. Matthew, chapter 21, verse 7. I didn't have time to read it there. I read it for you. It says, They brought the donkey and the cart. Donkey and the cart. Laid their clothes on them. On the donkey and the cart. And set him on them. They made Jesus sit on them, two donkeys at a time. I said, what this man is an acrobat or circus? What is he doing? Look, no, no, he's, look, look this is, there's no misprint here. In the King James Version, you read, he, he's, and he, they set him, one man, on them, on the two donkeys. Can you imagine a Jesus riding two donkeys at a time? Uh, God, God revealed that. On them, is there, is there, is there. No, no, it's little wonder that today there are people in the world who think that Jesus was a myth coming to our subject. Myth, a fairy tale. Things that they speak about him and things that happened in his time. That people came out of the graves. You remember I told them, I told you at the, at the meeting there. In the Gospel of Matthew, that Jesus, when he was crucified, the graves opened up and the people came out of the graves and they walked the streets of Jerusalem, left, right, left. People, but they were wearing napkins or skeletons. What? When you come out of the graves, after having slept there for 50 years, 100 years, what do you come out with? And they walked the streets of Jerusalem. Full stop. Full stop. What happened to them? What did they do? Nothing. nothing. Who saw them? Nobody. Out of the 27 books of the New Testament, only Matthew saw. <laughs> Can you imagine? 26 books, there's not one word of such a stupendous happening. People in London or Birmingham coming out of the graves and walking the streets. <laughs> and nobody sees. Wallah, it will be world news. No? Even in some village. In England, if this thing happened, it will be world news. The whole world will know by satellite. Everybody knows that, you know, in certain little town or village in England, the people came out of the graves and walked the streets. And then what did they do? What did they do? They went back to sleep again? <laughs> Can you imagine you came out of the grave? Let's say it was you. You came out and you marched with the group. And what do you do? Go back and sleep? Wouldn't you like to go and see your wife and children? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> so the people say, look, the world says that Jesus was a myth. 
This is a fairy tale. There's no such thing as Jesus. We believe that he was a reality. He was a historical person. And we need no proof. Allah Bari Ta'ala testifies to this in his holy book. That there was a woman called Maryam. And she bore a son without any male intervention. As Allah says in the Holy Quran, our Qari read from Surah Al Imran. Jesus, why did he, he didn't marry? Marry. Yeah, we'll answer all your questions, inshallah, at the end of it. Why he didn't marry? Poor man, they didn't give him a chance. They didn't give him a break. <laughs> the Jews didn't give him a break. From Surah Al Imran, Surah Al Imran, verse 52, our Qari was reading, and he read, Inna masala Isa. عند الله كمثل آدم خلقه من تراب ثم قال له كن فيكون. The similitude of the example of Jesus in the sight of Allah is like that of Adam. خلقه من تراب. Allah created him from dust and he says كن فيكون and he was created. So in other words, like Adam was a man, he is a man. And this is the testification of the Bible. Also, 83 times in the so-called New Testament, in the so-called Injil, 83 times, you see, you read the title, Son of Man, Son of Man, Son of Man, in Arabic, Ibn Adam, Ibn Adam, Ibn Adam, Son of Man, Son of Adam, Ibn... 83 times, he's described as the Son of Man. What is he? He's a man. He's not a myth. We believe that he was a real historical person. Or was he God? Our subject is man, myth, or God. Now, Thomas Carlyle, I think it must have been in this very London in 1840, a Britisher, I don't know whether it was English or Scotch, Thomas Carlyle, recognized as one of the greatest thinkers of the past century, Thomas Carlyle. In his lectures, he chose our Nabi Karim sallallahu alaihi as his hero prophet. And he begins his lecture to his Anglican audience by saying, In the history of the world, there will not again be any man ever so great whom his fellow men will take for a god. In other words, mankind has reached such a standard, such a level of intellectual understanding that they will not accept another human being as God. That's what he says, Thomas Carlyle. In other words, suppose I, Ahmad Didat, start flying in this room here like a bird. Hmm? I can walk on the water. I can give life back to the dead. I can tell you what you got, in, how much you got in your pocket. And I can give you every number of every notes that you have in your pocket. Will you accept me as your God? No, the man says, no, man. So how does he do it? He says, look, I don't know. You say, I don't know. You know, he's got some magic powers. Maybe he's got some jinns under his control. And they go and tell him, oh, there's some other you know, setup going on between this guy and whatever I'm telling you. But when you look at the man, he says, no, this is the man. I can see this man is about 70 years old. Before 70, he wasn't here. After, he won't be here for another 70. That's guaranteed. If I had a gun, I can shoot him. I can strangle him. No. All these thoughts go through your mind. He's a man, he's a man, he's a man. No man, what he can do. What great performer of miracles a man he is, but he is no God. This is the intellectual level that mankind is supposed to have reached. He says, he assumes that this is what mankind is now. No more! Then he says, how did it happen? That people are accepting human beings as gods. He says, nay, we may rationally ask. Thomas Carlyle says, nay, we may rationally ask, did any set of human beings ever really think that the man they saw there beside them, a god, the maker of this world, did they, any set of human beings at any time in the history of man, the people who abducted Sita, you know, Rama, the god of my ancestors, his wife Sita was abducted by Ravana, the king of Ceylon. Did he think when he abducted this woman that he was abducting the wife of his god? Did he? No. When the Pandavas went to fight Krishna, did they think they're fighting a god? No. When the Roman soldier punched Jesus in the stomach at the trial and says, come on, prophesy, who hit you? Come on, tell me, what's my name? Did he think that he was hitting his God? Punching his God? No. 
When the other soldier supposed to have lanced him on the side with a spear, did he think he was lancing his God? The answer is no. The contemporaries, how did it happen? He says, no. The way is, we are now living 2,000 years after the event, and people, when they read these stories, it sounds like fairy tales. This is man, it could have happened. You know, he was floating about, here, there, everywhere. You know, he's here, he's there, he's everywhere. Like Ahmad did that. You know, I was here about a week ago. You know that? No, that's 19th of June. It seems like yesterday, no? <laughs> See? And then he said, look, the guy was there, and he was here, and he was in Birmingham. And but you know how it's happening. This is, I left Birmingham this morning, I came here, I'll be back again tonight, tomorrow I'm in Blackburn, and next night I'm in Bradford, and then mm, and I'm back home, and I'm here, there, there, and back again. But now you know how it's happening. I'm not a ghost. I'm not a spook. Look, I need transport, this, that, everything to make all these things possible. But the man is saying, well, I saw him in, in Birmingham yesterday, man. I said, no. I saw him in Bradford. That guy said, I, I went through five countries in one day by car. And back, five countries I went through. In one day. <laughs> Can you imagine? It was in the UAE. So I was traveling with a car from Abu Dhabi to Dubai to Sharjah to <laughs> five countries. There are seven little states, city states. I went through five countries in one day and back again. <laughs> what was I? A spook? A ghost? No, no, no. I said, look. This is how I went in a car, good car. I was didn't do a certain job at the right at the end of this UAE, and I had to come back again. So, but now when you are reading the story, it's like a fairy tale in the book, the Bible. It's like a fairy tale. So when you read something like a fairy tale, you have a right to assume that this is myth. It's a fairy tale. Jeffrey Hunter. I don't know if you know his name. Jeffrey Hunter. He acted as Christ in one of these films called Jesus, uh, no, this is the day of triumph. That was a film about Jesus. He had to walk up the hill. They took this shooting, they did it in Jerusalem. Mount Zion, outside Jerusalem. And for the filming, they had to make him to walk up the hill. And he walked up the hill and panting for breath and sweating. He's a Christian, good Christian. When he went through this, acting Christ. He said, you know, for the first time in my life, I realized how human Jesus was. <laughs> but look, if he walked these hills, he must have also been panting for breath and sweating. Like, then I realized that how human Jesus was. Otherwise, you think he is a superman. Something more than superman. What superman does on your films, you know, superman one, two, and three, this Jesus was doing all that sort of things, you know, like a myth, mythology. So, the Quran comes to testify. In the ayah I read to you, from Surah Nisa. Surah Nisa. And it is a good practice, I'm suggesting, recommending to my brothers and sisters, that when anybody makes reference to the Quran, and he gives you the reference, make a habit of going home and checking up. Not that you distrust the speaker. You think the guy is pulling a fast one and he's lying. No, no, no. If you go and check it up at home, you read it again, it will refresh your memory, and that part of knowledge which you are rehearsing, it will become your property. Once it becomes your property, you can share it with others. Otherwise, this is good entertainment. This is all good entertainment. Good entertainment. Instead of wasting time in front of the TV, this is better TV, you see, do that in life, you see. But now, check up. So I said Surah Nisa. And for the bulk of the people, Muslims, non-Arabs, it's very difficult to find surahs in the Quran. Surah Nisa. Where will you find it? In the Mashhaf, in the Arabic Quran, very difficult for us non-Arabs. I don't know how easy it is for the Arabs to find, I don't know. I have been trying, wanting to ask, how easy? I said, look, Surah Zumar. How do you find it? Do you start paging through, you Arabs? How do you find it? Do you know where to find it? Or you just page through. So Surah Talaq. How do you find Surah Talaq? What do you do? Start paging through? Well, how do you find it? I don't know. I'm still going to ask <laughs> the Shaykh you know, when I have time, inshallah. But now, for the non-Arab, for us, if you have a translation like this particular one here, this is by Abdullah Yusuf Ali. 
I noticed that our brothers from Birmingham had taken the trouble to bring some over. This is Yusuf Ali translation. At the back of this volume, this encyclopedia of 2,000 pages, there is a very comprehensive index. Anybody gives you a name of a surah, it's a surah Nisa. Maybe you know, but generally, just like in a dictionary, look at the N, Nisa, it'll tell you chapter 4. Very easy to find. Every page is numbered. Chapter 4, ayah number 171. Very easy to find. Allah says, this Quran is available in the foyer. They are five pounds each. Wallah, they are very cheap. It's a wrong term, but we can't really talk about hadiyah. Hadiyah, hadiyah means what gift you'll give me for this. Now, the man wants to know how much. So I said, look, the hadiyah is five pounds. So what's that? What's that? I said, no, the hadiyah, you know, the gift. He said, so what gift? I want to know how much, what price. So, look, I said, don't waste time. He said, all right, look, it's five pounds. Take it, it's five pounds. I said, it's very cheap. Sorry, very cheap. Look at this Bible. I bought this one in Birmingham from a bookshop called Hudson's. This Bible here, I paid 9.95, 9 pounds, 95 pence. Just about 10 pounds. The VAT, I think it was over 10 pounds. I paid for this. This one here, you get two for five, 10 rands. Two, for, I mean 10 pounds. Very cheap. You owe it to yourself and your children to have this in the house. It'll improve your English. You'll have better understanding of Allah's kalam, what Allah wants, and everything on your fingertips. Whatever you want to know. You don't have to start fumbling. In this book, everything. You'll know about marriage and the M. You'll know about divorce and the D. You'll know about talaq. Look up, talaq, this is chapter 39. Just like that. Everything, what you want to know. Don't start going along and say talaq, talaq, talaq. Go and look up what Allah says, how to do the job if you must. <laughs> look, it's there. But we don't consult the book. We have heard from our fathers that when you get angry with your wife, what do you say? Talaq, talaq, talaq. <laughs> <laughs> and then you cry. <laughs> so you go to the sheikh, I don't know about our Arab sheikhs, but in my country, in my country, the Indian alims, they say you make halalu. Halalu. This halalu. He says, now nah, this woman of yours, this ex-wife of yours, now because you said talak, talak is finished, now she must marry another old man. <laughs> Stay with him at least for a night. At least they must go into a place, position where they can have a relationship. That's a, that's a must. Then he must divorce again, and then you remarry her. I said, look you fool, you made the mistake. Why punish the poor woman? What has she done? She, she is an innocent victim. Where's your sense, man? But no, you go through all this filth and dirt, filthiest, dirtiest thing that you can imagine, and you think you are a good Muslim because you didn't read the book. What do you want to know? You want to know about Jesus. And the J, open Jesus. See what he says. His birth. Open it and see. <coughs> Wallah, everything on your fingertips. The birth of Jesus is described here. A whole chapter is dedicated to Surah Maryam, chapter Mary, chapter 19. The Christians have taken out a pamphlet. They said, you know, Jesus is spoken of in the highest terms, 13 different places, different, different titles. And they are challenging the Muslims to produce another personality with any of those 13, two times, to any person. I haven't tried. No need to. Now the question arises, look, all this about Jesus, that he is the word, the kalima, which Allah bestowed upon Mary, that he is the Masih, the Messiah, his ruh, his this, his that, shh, all these beautiful titles for Jesus, for Jesus, for Jesus, and a chapter, whole chapter, named after his mother, Maryam. So do you see, this man, he deserves to be worshipped, he's God. Now, why is it, why is it that Allah mentions Jesus to that extent? Why is it that his mother's name has to be exonerated? That she is a virtuous woman? Why? Can you tell me? Tell me, why? Why so much about Jesus in the Quran and not about Muhammad? Why? Tell me, don't, don't be afraid. Guess. Why? Yes, brother. Because the Christians have a problem of finding out what, who Jesus really was. Anybody else? 
Why? Jesus, 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 you know, he's, a, he's the Messiah, he gave life to the dead, he did this, he did that, his mother was a wonderful woman, saintly woman. Why? One, one. Yes, my son. No, you see, there are so many allegations. There are so many allegations about Jesus and his mother, which needs to be clarified. So many charges. That's all right. That's all right. They say, you see, there's a dispute. There has been a dispute about Jesus and his mother. There was no dispute about the parentage of Muhammad. No dispute. There's a dispute about Jesus. So Allah says in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse 171, Ya Halal Kitab, O people of the book, O Jews and Christians, La Taghlufi Dinikum. Do not go to extremes in your religion. And don't say anything about Allah except the truth. Innam al Masih, most certainly the Messiah, translated Christ. Innam al Masih, Isa ibn Maryam, Jesus, son of Mary, Rasulullah, is the messenger of God. Wa kalimatuhu, and a word proceeding from him. Al Qaha ila Maryam wa ruhum minhum, which he bestowed upon Mary, and a spirit proceeding from him. Fa aminu billahi wa rasulihi. So believe in Allah and his messenger. They are going to extremes. One says that because he's got no father, he is the illegitimate child of Mary. Zina. Astaghfirullah. This is what they say, the Jews, that he is an illegitimate child. The other says because he's got no father, his father is God. They're both going to extremes. So Allah tells us what is the true position is that look, he's a true messenger of God. He is the word which Allah bestowed upon Mary. So believe in Allah and his messenger, Jesus, that he is a messenger of God. And because there are insinuations, allegations made against Maryam, the Quran comes to absolve her of all those filthy, dirty charges. The Jews, the Jews. I wouldn't have quoted at all. Wallah, what the Jews say. I just said illegitimate. I would not use the other word. But I have with me now an authority, and I'm glad also we are not in the masjid. We are, this is in the precincts of the masjid, but this is a hall. Here is a book, written by a leading Christian called Josh McDowell. He is the head of the campus crusade. Campus crusade, you know, universities. He goes to universities, and he goes and delivers lectures to them. And according to our friend Shorosh, he says, you know, Campus crusade for Christ has been raised up with a goal to preach Christ to the whole world by 1988. That's another six months time. By then now, they were going to preach Christ to the whole world. by 90, That's what God raised up this campus crusade for. It says here, Josh McDowell, uh, a graduate of Wheaton College and Magnum Lodi, graduate of Talbot Theological Seminary, is one of the most popular speakers on college and university campuses today. In the past 10 years, he has spoken to more than 5 million students. Did that come nowhere near that? He has to go on TV only to reach millions. Otherwise, shh, very difficult. A few hundred here, a few hundred there, 12,000 there. Hmm. He has spoken to more than 5 million students and faculty, uh, and faculty at, at over 550 universities in 53 countries. This mighty man, he says, he wants to prove that Jesus is a historical person. He's no myth. And to prove that, he produces the Jewish Talmud, Jewish religious book, to prove that Jesus is historical. What does he say? This is very interesting. To prove this Jesus is historical, he quotes the Jewish Talmud, religious book of the Jews. It says here, Jesus is referred to as Ben Pandera. In the Jewish Talmud, he is described as Ben Pandera. Ben means son of Pandera. Pandera was a Roman soldier who is alleged to have raped Maryam. And he produced this child. 
See, bin Pandera in the Jewish Talmud. Who's talking? This is a Christian missionary talking. If we said this, it calls for murder. Wallah. If we uttered these words, it calls for murder. We should be shot. Anybody talking like this? That Listen. Talmud title referring to Jesus bin Pandera or bin Pantere and Jehu, Je, Jeshu bin Pandera. Many scholars say Pandera is a play on words, a travesty on the Greek words of Virgin, Parthenos and so and so. And on the eve of the Passover. Mm -hmm. It says, Ar Shimon bin Azazi, Azai said concerning Jesus, I found a genealogical role in Jerusalem wherein was recorded such an one is a bastard of an adulteress this guy here is quoting the Jewish Talmud they are talking about Jesus that he is a bastard of an adulteress and again he is a bastard again and again and again Shh. Astaghfirullah to prove what? this is to prove what? Hmm. Listen. this is proving now to you these independent accounts Jewish Talmud, not talking about the Bible now, so the Jewish Talmud says, prove that in ancient times even the opponents of Christianity never doubted the historicity of Jesus. To prove that he was historical, I have to quote the Jewish Talmud to say that Jesus was a bastard, he was a bastard, he was a son of this Pandera, Roman soldier who raped Maryam. Now this is what the Christians stoop down to. You see? That they come down to using the words, quoting the Jewish Talmud, that the Jews say that he is the illegitimate child of Mary. The Christians say, no, he's the son of God. So Allah tells us, no, he's neither this nor that. He is a true messenger of God. He's God. He's the Messiah, he's the Messiah. Love him, respect him, revere him, follow him. But worship is due to God alone. Worship him, the Father in heaven, who is a real God. So, you see, the Christians now, they have developed new techniques in approaching Muslims. This our friend Shorosh, unfortunately, he is still living in the past. See, the Christians have tried, the method that he was trying, they have tried before. Attacking Islam, attacking the Holy Prophet, attacking the Quran. These are old-fashioned ways. They have developed new techniques. The real missionaries now, they have developed new techniques. This is an old-fashioned thing, I think the Arab mentality, I don't know where he got it from, from Palestine, he's still there, in the, he's living in the past. Shoros is living in the past. The new techniques are that these people, they come to us now, and they want to find common grounds. This common grounds is what Allah tells us to find with them. We haven't done it. Allah says, Qul, Ya Ahl al-Kitab, Ta'ala. Tell them, O people of the book, O Jews and Christians, come, Ta'ala. Ila kalimatin sawa'im baynana wa baynakum. That we come to common terms as between us and you. Let us get onto a common platform. And the terms and conditions of getting together, Allah says, Allah na'abuda illa Allah, that we worship none but Allah, wa la nushrika bihi shay'an, and that we associate no partners with him, wa la yattakhiza ba'duna ba'dan arbaban min duni Allah, and that we do not take from among ourselves, lords and patrons other than Allah. فَإِن تَوَلَّوْ فَكُلُوا شَهَدُوا بِأَنَّا مُسْلِمُونَ But if they turn back, tell them that we are Muslims. We have submitted our wills to the will of Allah. Find common grounds which we have failed to do. So the Christians, through experience, they learn. Not the Quran, they didn't read the Quran. But it's a natural thing to do. If you want to approach somebody, find common, common in communication, find common grounds. They are trying to find common grounds with us. Look at it. They did it. The language that you love to hear, the language of the Quran, they use that. They want to find easy way of approaching you. Look at this. Look at this book. No greater love. No greater love. Look at the beautiful rose. Multicolor. What, what book is this? Guess, guess, guess. I give you a Quran. Anybody who guesses what this book is all about, I give you this Quran, Deluxe Edition. <laughs> Who said that? <laughs> I'm beaten, I'm beaten. I'll give it to you then. As soon as I'm finished, you can have it. <laughs> I only have one. I only have one, please. Yeah, this is now a new way. Did you receive one like this before? No? You just guessed it. Shh. 
Maybe I let the cat out of the bag inadvertently. <laughs> Look at this. No greater love. Any young man will lap it up. He'll pick it up from, from the bookstores. It's, but they give it to you free. Wallah, they want to give to the Muslims free. <coughs> no greater love. Who wouldn't like to read it? There was a time when I lacked this sort of thing. You know. Ooh, when I left school, I was reading true love and romance. Ooh, you know, just. And if I came across this, this seems to me like Lady Chatterley's lover. <laughs> Banned in South Africa. But I said, when here's something, they're giving it to me free. No greater love. This is the New Testament. I want to catch us now with this, free. New, new methods. Now they've got a new method of approaching us, common grounds. Psychological. They come to our homes. We welcome them. This is our typical hospitality. We people, the Muslims, we are so hospitable that our hospitality goes against us. It's a cause of our own destruction. We are so nice, so sweet. Like the Indonesian. Nice, soft, kind people. So the Christians swallowing them, eating them up, chewing them up. Yeah, very nice, kind people. So they come. He said, you believe in Jesus? What do you say? You believe in Jesus? Yes. Say yes, yes, yes. You are not a Muslim if you don't believe in Jesus. So you know he was one of the mightiest messengers of God? Yes. What do you say? Say yes, yes, yes. We accept that. So you know Jesus was the Messiah, the Messiah? Yes. Translated Christ. You accept that? Said yes. Was Muhammad the Masihullah? Was he? Yes. No. 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 So you see, Jesus is Masihullah. Muhammad is Rasulullah. But you see, Isa is Rasul and Masih in the Quran. You know that? Jesus, Isa is Rasul and Masih in the Quran. Your prophet is only Rasul. Right? Right. One degree higher for Jesus. <laughs> it says, you know, Jesus was born miraculously without any male intervention. You believe that? Yes. Was Muhammad so born? No. no. Another degree for Jesus. He says, you know, Jesus gave life to the dead. He says, yes, bismillah. Huh? By Allah's permission. Huh? Did Muhammad give life to the dead, bismillah? He says, no, not a degree for Jesus. He says, where is Jesus? He's in heaven. He's alive? Yes. yes. He's coming back? Yes. yes. Where is your prophet Muhammad? Buried in Medina. Perhaps his bones have rotted in the grave. So no, we believe he's Hayatun Nabi, he's the living prophet. Yes, 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 yes. But that's metaphysically. Physically, maybe his bones have rotted in the grave. You say, maybe. Another degree for Jesus. Do you think God had a purpose in doing all that? He does things for nothing. You know, you just celebrated Eid al Adha, Kurbani, Bakrid, and you sacrificed a sheep or a goat or a cow. But when you look for that animal, an animal without blemish, no fault, horn not broken, ear not cut. Not blind, not limping, right? So yes. You think God Almighty, when He wants to make a sacrifice, is He going to look for second best? Who's second best? He already proved it to you. Muhammad, second best. Is He going to look for second best? Now you argue. <laughs> no, like. Look, that guy is a trained expert, karate expert. What do you know? What do you know about religion? Nothing. Sitting target, sitting ducks. That's what we have all become now. Because we have lost this, this impetus, we have lost our militancy, we didn't do the job for a thousand years. When you don't do a job, you lose the art of doing the job. You don't know what is all involved. Wallah, all this that he said means nothing. Wallah, it means nothing. It means nothing if you only know, if you have knowledge. When you have no knowledge, you are a sitting duck. You, you fight, you got the spirit to fight. So you fight. And you lose. The guy comes again. And he gives you another bashing. And you don't give up. You fight. Sooner or later, you can be converted. The fighter. The fighter is the guy who's going to lose. The safest fellow is the guy who says, hey, like, go away, man. I don't, I don't know anything. You know, I'm not interested in religion. He's safe. That poor fellow is safe. <laughs> but the fighter, you, you can't say, I don't want to talk to you. There's something wrong with you. So in my country, for every one boy we are losing, we're losing three girls. They want to argue and debate as well, our daughters. And when they are beaten, they run to the alim, and the poor alim, he doesn't know all this. This is not his line. This is something different, can't you see? It's a new development. Jesus is Masih. 
is Masiullah and Muhammad is only Rasulullah. Now how do you answer that? I said, look, I have a book. I have a book. Christ in Islam. That answers all your problems. And that book is free. Wallah, there's no copyright on it. If you want to reproduce it, go ahead and reproduce these books. Christ in Islam. Christ in Islam. It explains to you all this, what it is. Really, Wallah, is nothing. Let's deal with the first one. Jesus is Masih. Muhammad is only Rasul. Right. Just to show you how easy it is. Once you get the facts, the knowledge. He says, you know, let me tell you now that in your book, the Bible, Masih, Messiah, Christ is used for so many persons. Not only Jesus. In your book, the Bible, in the book of Isaiah, chapter 45, verse 1, God speaks to Cyrus, the Persian king, a mushrik, of an idol worshiper. And he calls him my Masih. He says, you are my anointed. That though thou does not know me, I have surnamed thee. Like you Kafir Mushrik, you son of perdition, you Jahannami, you don't know me, but still I call you my Masih. So the Christians translated that as anointed. The word is thou art my, you are my anointed. I says, now nah, that word anointed, what is it in Hebrew? It's Messiah. Same like Jesus. This Mushrik is, Allah says, Yoma Masih. Masi. In Greek, Christos, translated Christ. So God is telling that you are my Christ, you are my Masih, you are my Messiah. A Mushrik is, can be a Messiah, Masih. So what is Jesus being a Masih? Then pots and pans, the Bible says, were anointed, were made Masih. Masah pots and pans. What it means is this, I tell my wife, I said, you see this tea set that we bought? This is only for the VIPs, not for every Tom, Dick and Harry who visits us. Don't give them tea in this. You keep it for Sheikh Zahran and people like that. When they come, we'll take that out. <laughs> so when I say that, it means it's earmarked for the VIPs. In Hebrew, you have made Masaha, Masih for that, anointed for that, special purpose. That's what it means. Horns, the Bible says, were anointed. Columns, pillars, pillars were anointed. They made into Masih, Messiah. So pillars and poles, horns, and pots and pans, pots and pans, and mushriks are all made into Masih, Christ, Christ, Christ. So what is Christ? It means specially appointed for a special purpose. Now every prophet is a Masih. Every prophet is a Messiah. Every prophet is Christ. So how do I say that? The Quran doesn't say that. I said, no, I'm telling you. You see, because Christ means one who is appointed. But why only Jesus? I said, you see, there are certain titles which we use exclusively for certain people. Like for example, Look, we say Rasulullah. Who is Rasulullah? Automatically, the Muslim says Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. But look, the Quran says Musa is Rasulullah, Ibrahim is Rasulullah, Isa is Rasulullah. But how is that you say Muhammad Rasulullah? No, no. In our minds, this word Rasulullah associated with our Nabi. Is Khalilullah? Who is Khalilullah? Ibrahim means the friend of Allah. Abraham is his friend. What about all the other prophets? His enemies? Huh? Are they all his enemies? Only Ibrahim is his friend. No, no, no. Every, every prophet is his Khalil. Kalimullah. So who's Kalimullah? It's a Musa. He said, didn't Isa speak to Allah? He said, yes. Didn't Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi speak to Allah? He said, yes. Then why Musa Kalimullah? This is how specific titles you give to certain specific persons. But these are common properties for everybody. But we especially, we say, Alfred the Great. You heard in English history? The guy who burned the cake. Alfred the Great, huh? all the other English kings, very tiny little ones, <laughs> Richard the Lionhearted, Richard the Lionhearted, you know, your English history, yes, all the other English kings were chicken-hearted. <laughs> <laughs> no, it doesn't mean that. Can you see? It's just certain specific titles you reserve for certain persons, but they can be universally applied. Now once you know, 
When he comes out, he says, look, you can make a monkey out of him. Wallah, you can make a monkey out of the fellow. He said, look, what are you talking about? Pots and pans, horns, pillars, mushriks. They all can be Messiah, Messiah in, according to your book. You explain that. So once you go through these little booklets like this, Inshallah, these are those little dynamites. These are those little pebbles that Hazrat Dawud picked up. You remember Hazrat Dawud See these Palestinians again. The Palestinians and the, Arab, the, and the Jews have been having it out for more than 3,000 years. They're fighting, fighting, fighting. And you read in the Bible, and they were destroyed utterly. Finished. And they come back from nowhere, like ghosts, the Palestinians. And they destroyed them utterly, and they come back again. I don't know where they from. The Bible says, and they destroyed them utterly, and they're back again. And they destroyed them utterly, and they're back again. Amazing, these Palestinians. You know, they never go out of circulation. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. So, what was I saying? <laughs> says, pebbles, pebbles. The Palestinians and the Jews having it out. So now comes a time that the Palestinians, they have a giant in their midst. Goliath, Jalut. And according to Guinness Book of Records I was reading today, that according to the biblical, this thing he was nine foot six. About that height of more, nine foot six. He was nine foot six. A bit of an exaggeration, but nine foot six. Now, once you have a guy like that in your midst, naturally you feel that now we can battle anybody. So this Jalut, from a hilltop, he cries out to the Bani Israel on the opposite hill. Say, hey, you Jews! Is there anybody there who will take me on? I'll chew you alive! And the Bani Israel were shivering in their pants. I don't know if they used to wear pants those days, you know. But figuratively, they were shivering in their pants. Nobody, nobody wants to come forward. So little Dawood is there. He is looking after his father's sheep. So he sees the opportunity. Man, this is a fantastic target. This is a sitting duck. Big giant, eight foot giant. This is a nine foot six. No man, seven foot. This guy is slow, cumbersome. You know when you're a giant, abnormal. He is not even steady on his feet as if he's drunk. He's not drunk. But the size, cumbersome. He can't control himself. He's an easy target, man, for his sling. And his mouth waters. What an opportunity. Shh. So he comes to Talut, Saul. He say, I'll take him on. So what? You go and look after your father's sheep. The young man is enthusiastic. He says, no man, you don't know. This guy here is so easy to knock him over. Talut couldn't resist his enthusiasm. He said, all right, here. Here's my sword and my shield. So little Zawud says, look, I, don't, I haven't handled this in my life before. Maybe it's also too heavy for him. He said, look, I know my sling. That old-fashioned sling. There was no rubber those days. They hadn't discovered rubber then. It's a pouch with two strings. You put a stone in the middle and you swing. Gain momentum and let go one side. And if you are used to it, you know how to hit your mark. That old-fashioned sling. We call it in India, we call it Gopan. So what? Bigger joke. So it was a bigger joke. Now with a toy. This is a toy. So I said, all right, if you want to commit suicide, go. So he walks down the hill and at the stream he picks up a few pebbles. These are those pebbles. These booklets are those pebbles. With these pebbles, you master these and you can crack the Jalut, crack the Jalut skull. The missionary, this bishop, archbishops, whoever they are, with this knowledge here, you can crack his skull. So this is the advice I wanted to give to you. Get these little pebbles and go to town. Now, my dear brothers and sisters, if there are any questions on what I have spoken so far or anything allied to what I have said, you are at liberty to ask. Questions? Of course, if you haven't got questions, that means you are all converted, I can get back quicker to Birmingham. <laughs> yes, my son. It's not about today's subject. It's yeah. about uh, uh, why the Christians don't allow people to marry more than one wife. When in Leviticus 1818, it is allowed to marry more than one, one, one wife as long as the wife and wife, the wife's sister or the wife's mother. Yeah. And Jesus said not to 
uh, he, he came and he said, I'm going to change the law. Uh, the question was, how is it that there in the Old Testament there is an injunction given that you can marry women more than one as long as they are not your sisters or your mothers or your daughters and things like that. Restrictions are given but they were allowed to marry more than one. And the prophets as we read in the Old Testament almost each and every one of them had more than one wife. How is it? And Jesus Christ didn't condemn polygamy, not in the least. How is it that the Christians are today saying that only one man, one woman? That is the question. Now the thing is, this is their own creation. The Christian world up to almost yesterday, they practice polygamy. Now Allah doesn't tell us to go and have two or three or four. But there are circumstances in life when it is necessary to protect womanhood. Like I was giving reference, I don't know whether it was last night or the, at the meeting that this is a solution to your problem more especially the West in America at the present moment there are 7.8 million more women than men almost 8 million women at the present moment there are 20 million women in America without husbands 20 million but even if every man in America got married there will be 7.8 million women left without husbands what is the solution? the answer we are asking them provide the answer here in England, soon after the war, there was a news item that on the east coast of England, there were 1.6 million more women than men on the east coast alone. Or over Britain, 4 million more women than men. In Britain, if every man gets married, there will still be 4 million women who can't get husbands. And soon after the war, a news item, dateline from London, I was reading in my country, it said 5,000 misfits to be shipped to America. You know the human mind is so imaginative that when you read something you think you got the whole picture. So I'm imagining that these misfits must be cripples with hair lip, with club foot, that they are going, being sent to America for treatment. That's the imagination. Thinking that America medically is far more advanced than Britain. That's what I'm thinking. But when I read further, the, item, the news item said that these 5,000 misfits were the offsprings of Negro soldiers stationed in England during the war. They were the offsprings of Negro soldiers. That they were too dark, too black to be absorbed into English society. These Negro children to these British girls. That in your home if you had this little, one of these little ones and with crinkly hair and stubbed nose, he says, now who's this? He says, my sister Mary's child. Everybody comes around, who's this? He says, my sister Mary's child. It's like a dagger in your heart. So what do you do with things like that? Ship them to America. To be joined with the Negro society in America. So they send them. Maybe Andrew Young was one of those. Maybe Cassius Clay, Muhammad Ali might have been one of those. We don't know. But this is 5,000 misfits were shipped to America. They were not, they couldn't be fitted into British society. So I am asking the question that these 5,000 misfits, how did they come about? How many Negro soldiers were in England during the course of the war compared to the whites? The white Australian, the white New Zealander, the white New uh, South African, the white Free French, the white Poles, and on, and the white British, and the white American, the white Canadian. How many blacks were there? A handful. Compared to the white soldiers, a handful. So what amount of adultery, fornication was committed in Christian England to produce 5,000 misfits, misfits during the course of the war? What amount? You tell me, to create all those illegitimate bastard children. How many? Thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands, they, you created them. So Islam gives a solution to a problem. It's not a tonic, being offered as a tonic, Coca-Cola or Pepsi-Cola, no, no. This is a remedy, an answer, a solution to a problem. And on BBC TV, some years ago there was a program. The program was about polygamy. So they brought a group of women, asking them one by one what do you think madam so a woman gives a point of view saying, mm, oh my dead body I'll never allow my husband to have another wife and you madam he said well you see if the man will look after me and my children I don't mind sharing a husband and you madam never and you madam so by the time the program was over half an hour gone so these 
organizers, they got those women again. So what kind of women were they, those who didn't mind and what kind of women were those who opposed it to the nail? So they brought the same team back again onto the program. Now, madam, are you married? I said, yes. Do you mind sharing a hus your husband with another woman? I said, never. You, are you married? No. You mind sharing a husband? I said, no, I don't mind you know, if I get somebody to look after me and my children. Right. It was 50-50. Those who had, they said they won't share. Those who didn't have, they didn't mind sharing. So it's a question of haves and have nots, you see. Vested interests. But otherwise, it is a solution to a problem. This is what. Yes, any other question? Yes, ma'am. Uh, what can we do to combat Christian missionary activities in Indonesia, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Lebanon, and India, and Islamic countries? The only way you can meet these forces is to study the textbooks. There is no other way. See, Allah Ta'ala gives us the secret. The secret is, Allah says, Pul hatu burhanakum. Whenever anybody makes a claim, they're making a claim, they say, Waqalu, they say, Lan yadkhulal jannata illa man kana hudan av nasara. That you Muslims will never, never enter jannat. There's no heaven for you. Unless you become a Jew or unless you become a Christian. That's a claim then, that's a claim now. Though the Jews have fallen out of the race, they only want political recognition. They are not interested in converting you. You have to be born a Jew to be a Jew. They want you to accept them that Palestine, you give it to them, there will be peace between us and them. Because our is not a racial war, it is not a religious war. Our battle with the Jew is for that piece of land which they have stolen from our brethren. That's our battle. They are not interested in converting us. But the Christian we know, they are making a mess out of the Muslim world. They have perverted more Pakistanis into Christianity since independence than in the 150 years of British rule. They have perverted, converted more Bangladeshis into Christianity since independence than in the previous 150 years of British rule. They have converted 15 million Indonesians into Christianity. And by the turn of the century, they want to make Christ Indonesia a Christian nation. And there are every sign that they will succeed. The answer to this problem is that you have to master his book. Allah says, when they make any claim, it's still ka'amani yuhum, that this is their wishful thinking, vain desires, hallucination. We say bakwas, bakwas, babbling, babbling. Don't be afraid of them. Pull! Tell them how to burhan. Produce your proof. Your burhan. In kuntum swadikin, if you're speaking the truth, let's have a look at your certificate that entitles you to heaven and destines us to hell. Let's have a look at it. Did you do that? No. 1,000 years, 1,400 years, have you been asking them for the Burhan? No. I want to know why. I'm asking the Arabs, how is it that you read this and you didn't do the job? 1,400 1, years, the Muslims are supreme in Egypt. 1,400 years. And today they are boasting there are 10 million Coptic Christians there. In Egypt. 1,400 years, you had a good inning. And in 1,400 years you could make a dent in the Christian community? Why? Simple reason. You didn't ask for his burhan. And unless you ask for his burhan, you can't talk. There's no way you can open the subject with them. They already their program brainwashed to say, Christ died for the sins, salvation is yours. You can sweat it out. Five times a day you can pray, fast for one whole month. These are all like filthy rags, he says. Rubbish, worthless rubbish. He says, Salvation only comes through the blood of the Lord Jesus. Once you accept that, all our philosophy, psychology, logic, it won't make a headway. You've got to break through. And the only way you can break through is, Kul hatu burhanakum. Let us have a look at your burhan, your proof. And when you see that, you find it's all hocus pocus. You can find, you can go to town, you can crack his skull. He hasn't got a thing. Wallah, he hasn't got a thing. And there isn't Christians born who can stand before you if you only master these little pebbles, these little booklets. And each and every Muslim should be going and doing his job. You don't wait for Ahmad Didat or Sheikh bin Baz or so-and-so. Sheikh. This is every Muslim's duty. According to your capacity, just learn these things, master them and go to town, man. It's a privilege Allah has given you and me. He said, you the hero who Allah deen kulli. He's given you a deen, that's to master, overcome and supersede them all. Bulldoze them all. That's what Allah says. This is the destiny of his deen. Wallahu kari hal mushrikoon. He said, now mind how the mushrik might not like it. This is the destiny of his deen. Master them all. Bulldoze them all. You believe in it? You believe in it? Yes. I want to hear. Yes. 
Yes, yes. That's why you're sitting on your backside doing nothing. Yeah, we're doing nothing. You sit on our backside doing nothing. We believe what you believe. You don't really believe. That's the trouble. If we say we believe, we don't really believe. How are you? Yes, my son. Yes, in a debate, you put an Rosh in a political perspective. Now, if you look at the uh, history and analyze the facts, all Palestinians have been killed <coughs> by so-called Arab leaders than by the Israelis. More of the suppression is coming from our Arab leaders. If I was to call for Islam in Iraq, I'll be put into prison. If I was to call for Islam in Syria, I'll be hanged. So can you comment on that subject, please? You're talking about politics. <laughs> you see, our battle was, our battle was the Quran or the Bible. That was the subject of the debate, the Quran or the Bible, which is God's word. And in that battle, this Palestinian Christian has already sold out. That's, that's for you to now go and fight them out. You go and fight them now, you see. Yes, see. My battle is with the guy who is coming along and knocking at my door. Talk to him, how to talk to him. Yes, Ben? Between the time of 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 were there any Muslims existing in the time of Hazrat Isa salam, in the time of Jesus? Is that the question? Yes. You see, anyone who hearkened to the message of Hazrat Isa salam was a Muslim. Jesus was a Muslim and his religion was Islam. There was no such thing as Christianity. The teachings of the church where they say that Jesus is God is not his teaching. He never preached any such thing. He is telling his people that they must be better than the Jew. It's, unless you are better than the Jew, the Jew was just formalistic, he's keeping the letter of the law, forgetting the spirit. He says, there is no heaven for you. That's his teaching. He's telling them, come, I will teach you how to pray. Pray like this. And he's teaching them. He said, oh, our Father, which art in heaven, God Almighty, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That is the prayer that he thought. He didn't say the father of Jesus Christ in heaven or me Jesus who is in heaven. He's talking about the father in heaven. So in other words, he was preaching nothing but Islam. The churches is quite a different thing altogether. It's not his teaching. They are their own creation. But anyone who followed Musa alayhi salam was a Muslim. Anyone who followed Isa alayhi salam was a Muslim. But these people have now deviated. They have deviated from the teachings of Hadati Sari Sara. Yes, brother. You had a question? Yes. This uh, booklet of, of yours, the Quran, the Ultimate American, uh, well, I have the cassette of it, you know, all the CNS, and uh, you don't see it. But whenever I try to show it to our uh, mullahs, you know, they don't accept it and they don't believe in it. Um, could you please. Uh, uh, there was a book I had written. Al-Quran, the ultimate miracle. I had delivered talks on the subject and there were videotapes and cassettes available. But this man who originally made the discovery, which I found useful in talking to Muslims and non-Muslims, but this man, a sickness has developed. Now he's claiming to be a new Rasulullah, like what Baha'u'llah was at one time and Mirza Ghulam Ahmad. This is a sickness, this is a sickness that is quite common. You see, once a person, you know, he finds that he's so clever, that people are, you know, hero-worshipping him. And, you know, whatever I say, I know these people will believe. So the man creates a sickness. This man, I can make claims. Today, this guy called Rashad Khalifa, he is the man who discovered this theory, alayhi hatisat asha. Now he said he is a new Rasul. He is a messenger of God. There are certain flaws in the theory, but... Besides that, now he's claiming now, on the basis of that discovery that he is Rasulullah. And now, he came out to prove first was that the Quran is Allah's Kalam, not changed. Not one letter is changed. Now, through the same theory he's proving, he's trying to prove that, look, the Quran is changed. That there are verses in the Quran which are not supposed to be there. Astaghfirullah. So, I challenge this man to a debate. I send him a telegram that I am prepared to hire the Madison Square Garden in New York at my expense. I said, you Khabis from Tucson, come over. And he says, I've proved to the world that you are a kazab, a liar, and a cheat, and a false. A false guy. 
So he says, no, I don't want to come to the Madison Square Garden. You come to Tucson in private. He wants to have a discussion. I said, look, you're rubbish. There's no time for me to talk to people in private. Come, come. You are the true messenger of God. Then come forward, man. I'm prepared to talk to you. So I have discontinued with the tape as well as the book and the cassette. No more. I have no more book, no more video, no more cassette. Finish. There's so much more there. We don't want to create you know, unnecessary strife among the Muslims. And that guy, every time I'm speaking, he's trying to capitalize upon that. So he's trying to win your sympathy that he is a new messenger of God. Finish. We got nothing to do with him. He is an imposter and a liar and a cheat and a kazab. Discontinued. Finish. No more. Yes, my son. Yes, there. That's right. White shirt. White shirt. Yes, your white shirt. Yes. Can you explain what you mean these are about gospel of Barnabas? You see, the gospel of Barnabas, it mentions our Nabiya Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa by name. That Isa alayhi salam, Jesus Christ, he prophesied about the coming of another messenger whose name will be Muhammad sallallahu alayhi But now this book is not recognized by the bulk of Christendom. They say it's a forgery. They say this is not authentic. Now, the Muslim is wasting his time. Because Allah commands us to demand proof by asking the Christian or the Jew or whoever, Kul hatu burhanakum. Produce your proof. And they have produced the proof, the Bible. Nobody produced Barnabas to you, did they? No. So talk about what he's proof, what he's claiming to be true, talk about that. And once you do that, get these booklets of mine, you won't need Barnabas. These booklets will do the job with his Burhan. The Prophet said, I came to confirm what's between my hand from Tawara and Injil. So what is Injil? And was the revelation and was it Jesus' time? Or after that being written? <coughs> the Injil is the Wahi, the revelation, which Allah gave Hazrat Isa alayhi salam. Whatever He gave to Hazrat Isa alayhi salam, Jesus Christ, that is the Injil, the Wahi. Where is it? You ask that to the Christians. Where is it? Because the Gospels, the so-called Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, they all say that Jesus went to a certain place and he preached the Gospel. Gospel means Injil. He went somewhere else and he preached the Gospel. He went somewhere else and he preached the Gospel. Every book says he went and preached the Gospel. Injil, 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 Injil. So we are asking, did he have Matthew, Mark, Luke and John under his arm? Is that what he was preaching? No. Where is that Injil which he was preaching? That is what Allah gave him. So whatever Allah gave him is the truth. But they haven't got it. So as the mention about the book, the Bible, in Red Letter Bible, I said 21, the one in which Shorosh gave me, 21 out of 27, there's not even a red letter dot or dash. Supposed to be of Jesus. That's you got a chance, you got a chance. There is someone here, yes. Well, after your thought-provoking speech and very logical explanation, I don't think any other question remains to be asked. But one question which is generally addressed by the so-called Christians in the West, particularly to some Muslim scholars, they say that we were born Christian, but now we don't believe in the existence of any God. So how to convince such so-called materialists and atheists and how to prove before them the existence of God in the light of the Holy Quran. You see, before you start with him with the Holy Quran, how is he going to listen to you about the Quran when he says he doesn't believe in God? So, these people you are talking about, this Westerner, whoever he is, whether American or British, he is still a Christian subconsciously at the back of his mind. Because as soon as a fight starts between the Muslim and the Christian, he will take the Christian side. Why? He is still a Christian subconsciously. So, now what you do with him? A technique, I show you. As soon as you ask any of these people, you meet them in the flesh, you say, what church you belong to? He said, no, I don't go to any church. I don't believe in God. So you tell him, congratulations to you. Amazing, amazing. The man said, I don't believe in God. I said, tell him congratulations to you. 
and the guy gets shocked. He expects you to chop off his head. Kafir, mardud. Hmm? You don't believe in God? Chop off his head. That's what he expects from the man of religion. I said, no, congratulations to you. He said, why congratulations? I said, you see, if you told me you are a Christian, no congratulations. Because your father was a Christian, your mother was a Christian. Right? He said, right. So what did you do? Nothing. You tell me you are a Muslim? No congratulations. Why? Because your father was a Muslim, your mother was a Muslim. What did you do? Nothing. But you tell me you don't believe in God? I said, congratulations. Because you have been thinking. What made you to reach that stage where you say there is no God? You were thinking. So for that I congratulate you. What were you thinking? Well, about what you heard, the stories you heard, you went to Sunday school. Your environment, they're telling you about Adam and Eve. Yes. You read about Adam and Eve in Sunday school, you heard the stories. Yes, Adam and Eve, they were put into the garden. When God made them in the garden, He said, now look, eat and drink. Eat any of the fruit in the garden except this one tree. In the middle of the garden, the fruit of that tree thou shalt not eat. Because the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Right? He said, yes. And they act. And they start, they discovered that they were naked. Prior to that, they were in a state of innocence, like little children. They didn't know what was what. As soon as they act, that was supposed to be the tree of knowledge, the fruit of the tree of knowledge. So they realized that they were naked. So they started plucking leaves and covering themselves up. And Adam heard. I'm reading the Bible, the Bible which he read. And Adam heard the footsteps of God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. You know, mighty King Kong. Boom, 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 boom. That's what the Bible says. He heard the footsteps of God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. It was afternoon, late afternoon. So Adam went and hid himself away in the bushes. So God comes and stands where Adam was a few seconds before and he scans. He can't see them. So he shouts, Adam, Adam, where art thou? Kaha hai tu? Kaha hai? Poor God, he didn't know where Adam was. <laughs> or maybe he was playing hide and seek. Look, look, we do play hide and seek. You see, I do it with my grandson. He's four year old now. See, I go home, my grandson, he's there in front of me. But I look up all over. I say, Rais, Rais, tu kache. I say, where are you? And he's just having a good laugh. He thinks, you know, grandpa can't see. <laughs> Look, I'm playing the fools with him. He says, where are you? Where are you? <laughs> He's laughing. <laughs> so maybe God Almighty also, you know, he wants to play a little joke with Adam and Eve. So Adam peeps through the bushes and he says, I'm here. So why do you behave like that? You have done something wrong. He says, no, I was naked. So how do you know you were naked? You have been eating of the fruit. He said, no, the woman that thou gave us to me, that woman. You see, if you didn't give me that woman, I wouldn't be in trouble. You gave me that woman, now got me into trouble. A new woman? He said, yeah, the serpent that beguiled me, passing the buck, the oldest game in the world. You know, don't own up. Now, I'm asking the Muslim, you. You believe in a God like that? You believe in a God like that? No. no. He says, he also doesn't believe in a God like that. So, congratulations. You read further down, Genesis. Hazrat Musa alayhi salam to see God. So God says, look, you can't see me and live. The Quran says, Lan tarani, you'll never see me. But in the Bible, he's insistent. You know, like a spoiled child. He said, look, man, oh Lord, I love you so much, I must see you. What can you do with a fellow like that? It's all right, I will appease you. So God Almighty puts him between two rocks and puts his hand in the opening. So Musa alayhi salam can't see him. Then he turns his back and he takes up his hand. And Musa saw the back of God, saw his backside. Because his front side, if he saw, he would have died. You believe in a God like that? Who shows his backside to Musa? He says, no. Look, he's agreeing with you. What you want to tell him, he's telling you himself. You believe that Mary carried God for nine months? Ask him. He said, no. You believe that? That Maryam carried God for nine months? And this God was born and was circumcised on the eighth day? You believe that? No. no. So look, that man has taken the first step towards Islam. What is the first step? Anybody want to accept Islam? What do you say? Say, start. La. la. What is la? No. no. La ilaha. There's no God. There's no object of worship. Except Allah. 
So he's taking the first step. He's saying, La ilaha. This. Hmm? That God. Hmm? That God. No. He's taking the first step, man. Take him the following step. Take him further. That's your job now. Congratulate him and take him out from there. So come, come, man. How did this thing come into being? So he explains to you. And you find the Quran confirms. The Quran confirms. He says, look, man, this book is telling what you are telling me. Inshallah, you'll be able to do the job. Read the Quran because it is their constitution, it provides the solutions to their problems. With what purpose or intention in mind do the Christians read the Bible? Well, I, you see, the question is that the Muslims read the Quran with the idea, the intention that this is Allah's constitution for us, that we may guide our lives by it. The Christians, with what intention do they read the Bible? Generally, the Christians, they're only reading with one idea that this Bible just proves that the system of salvation given by God is that this God Almighty who made Adam and Eve, he's going to come into the world some 6,000 years after, 4,000 years after Adam, and he's going to come and die for your sins. This is what he's interested in. So although they are not religious, but at the back of the mind, this is salvation. Rahe Najat, Jannah. This is what they have, they get it. So they believe, they believe. This is like a talisman, like a taviz. You know, once you have the book, and you know you believe, salvation is yes. They're not interested in practicing anything. Because they say, it's not works. Not by works that you get heaven, it is belief. Like Swagat was saying, he said, you see, God Almighty, once he gives you salvation, you do something, you say you accept Jesus. So he gives it to you. Jannah, he'll give you. You're now in his good books. You do something evil, he's going to take it away again. And then you do good, he gives you again. And you do something evil, he takes it. And say, no, God doesn't do that. Once you have achieved rich salvation, finish. He paid for it. Jesus Christ paid for it. So this is beautiful idea. If it was true, most fantastic idea, you know, for getting heaven. You don't have to do anything. You just believe. You say you believe and salvation is yours. Of course, for us, we have to sweat. And it's easier just to believe and get it. So they are only wanting to find justification for that belief that Christ died for the sins. Uh, our sister, yes. Well, Quran says that Muslims can lie Jewish and Christian do. But then you tell me, or then you prove that any Christian or Jewish woman has ever produced a Muslim, black Muslim child. The Spanish uh, downfall was due to these Christianities. In India, the downfall was due to these marriages with the Hindus and adults and right. Anywhere you go, where there are those marriages, there is no Islam that's no. Because children, they are brought up with the, the mother. They spend more of their time with the mother. And whatever they educate them, they raise it up. So many of our brothers, they take this advantage that we can marry Jewish or Christian women. But don't they think that well, what are they doing the consequences? Uh, the question is about Muslims marrying Christian and Jewish women. Allah tells us that you can marry women of the Ahlul Kitab who are the, no, no, the word mutata, the, the pious women among them. Well, uh, Muhsinat of those who are virtuous women. Among Muslims, when you're looking for wives, we must look for virtuous women. When you find among the Christians, they should be better than any Muslim woman you can find. But generally, our brother and they look get the rejects. You see, <laughs> no, no, this is, uh, i give you an example. Uh, see, when I was working in the furniture trade, I had a brother working with me, Mr. Hafiji, and I saw his brother one day with a colored woman, it's a mixture between black and white in South Africa. And to all appearances, you know, she was a spent force, you know, ugly and all that. So I'm coming and telling this friend of mine, I said, you know, I saw your brother with his wife. And what a thing, man, what a thing. He says, you see, Mota, big brother is telling me, some people, they eat meat and they throw away the bones. My brother picks it up and makes a garland. So there are brothers, Muslim brothers, they make garlands around their necks, you know. Where did they find this woman? He said, on the dance floor. Where did you find her? In the cinema. She went out with you. She went out with how many others before you? Allah says, Muhsinat, good women, virtuous women. So our brethren are finding easy way out. 
This Islam allows. What does Islam allow? You see, the Ummah, the Ummah was such an Ummah that's given that permission that the whole Ummah, everybody is eager to have that woman changed. Your business, my business, everybody's business. There's no such thing as my business and your business. So I have a right, but I'm shut up. Then the children that are born, what happened? Marriages break up. Sometimes it's a, con a conversion of convenience. Generally, I have seen in my country, the woman is converted. What is that? He goes with this woman to the sheikh, to the Molvi, and says, look, I want to marry this woman. So the Molvi sahab asks the woman, you want to marry him? He said, yes. So say the kalima. So what's that? Say, la ilaha illallah. So she said, la ilaha Muhammad Rasulullah. That's right. Now from today, your name is Fatima. You want to marry this fellow? He said, yes. San nikahu min sunnati, fa man raghiban sunnati, fa laysa minni, au kama qal. Right. He's got a license. <laughs> well, this is the type of people that we have. You see, when it's, what is conversion? You've got to change that person's outlook, complete outlook on life. At the back of the mind, she's still worshipping Jesus. Then some of them, they say openly they are Christians. And they're making their homes as centers for Christian activity. And the men, we are losing men now. Because of the woman, they marry Christian women and they're getting lost. In South Africa at the present moment, there are so many Muslim murtads are coming forward. You find Shabbir Wadi, his wife is a Christian. Salim Adam, his wife is a Christian. All these because of the women, they are all Christianized now. Even if they were not Christianized, as soon as the marriage breaks up, where does the woman go with your Fatmas and Khadijas and Muhammads? Back again to her people. And where are they going? Aunties and grannies are going to church. So your little Fatmas and Khadijas and Muhammads are going to church. They are getting Christianized. Marriage break, you die. Where does she go? To your grandfather? No. She goes to her grannies and her aunties. Shh. We are losing by the thousands, Wallah. The fools don't know what they are bargaining. They're playing with fire. I'm telling you that unless this Christian or Jewess, if you can make her a better person than your mother at home, don't take a chance. Unless you can make her better than your mother at home, better than your sister at home, I says you are playing with fire. Are you prepared to do that? You've got no time. And you're not a man anymore. You are not a man anymore. You are male, all right, but you're not a man anymore. You haven't got that power that men had. Like one of our poets, he's put it very beautifully. I hope I'll be able to translate it. He says, Sheikh Sahib, bhi to parde ke koi hami nahi. Sheikh Sahib, bhi to parde ke koi hami nahi. Muft mein college ke ladke unse badzan ho gaye. وَعَزَمِ فَرْمَا دِيَا کَلْ آپ نے یہ صاف صاف پردہ آخر کس سے ہو جب مرد ہی زن ہو گئے I'll translate it I'll translate it I will translate it He says this learned man I'm not talking about our sheikh here He says this sheikh sahib He is also not a supporter of pardah You know the pardah the veil He is not a supporter of pardah Wazen, he said, yesterday in the wise, in the lecture, he said clearly, clearly, very clearly. He says, for no reason these university students are getting dissatisfied with him. He explained yesterday in the lecture very, very clearly that after all, against whom are you going to make parda when men themselves are effeminate? They are also already woman-like. The men are not men anymore. So in other words, you are also like women, you know. So what is, this is what has come to men, that you are not man enough to exert your rights even in your own home with your own wife. So don't take a chance, don't get burnt. I think that the best thing to conclude our meeting is to read Surah Al-Asr together. Mashallah. So, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Wal-Asr. Inna al-insana fi khusr. Illa al-ladhina aman wa amil salihat. Wa tawasaw bil-haq. Wa tawasaw bil-haq. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Wa sallallahu alayhi wa sallam.